Okay, welcome everyone. It's so good to see all of you here. Um, it is my honor to welcome you to the final installment of our fall 2022 JAMI Career Webinar Series. Our topic today is the post-pandemic job search. My name is Yas Hardaway and I'm the Executive Director of Career Services here at GSEP. And this program is in partnership between GSEP Career Services and Alumni Relations. For those of you who are new to our JAMI Communities of Practice, you may be wondering, what is JAMI? JAMI is a Swahili term for community, and our JAMI Communities of Practice programs are designed to provide up-to-date labor market insight in the fields of education and psychology, as well as connect you to a larger professional network. In the fall, we host our JAMI Career Webinar Series, which are moderated Q&A panels, and in the spring, we host our JAMI Career Connect sessions, which are interactive learning sessions composed of breakout room discussions. So let's take a look at what is in store for today. A few housekeeping items. The session is being recorded and you'll have access to the recording um, shortly following the session, as well as our other JAMI recordings. Live transcription is provided, and if you have any questions, we certainly encourage you to ask those, and please feel free to use the chat to answer to, to ask your questions. Our learning outcomes for today, what do we hope that you gain from today's session? We have three learning outcomes identified. The first one is that we hope that you learn how you can ask, assess whether or not a work culture truly promotes the authentic expression of each individual. Number two, we hope that you learn how you can create a flexible work life that aligns with your values and your priorities. And number three, we hope that you learn how to utilize JobScan, which is an online career tool to optimize your employment application materials, so your resume, cover letter, LinkedIn profile, specifically for applicant tracking systems so that you can land the interview. I also want to make reference to a resource that you can access now. It's our JAMI Career Webinar Drive. And in this drive, um, you will find a list of our panelists, so our speaker lineup and their bios. You'll also be able to access today's recording as well as previous JAMI recordings. And then finally, we have a resource list for you, which includes our DEIB resource resources, as well as a couple of other job search resources related to today's just discussion. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Renee Dorn, who will be leading our panel discussion. Dr. Dorn? Thank you so much, Yaz, and welcome everyone to our JAMI session. Uh, this is our final one for this fall season, but I'm so proud to be able to introduce our panelists for today. So I'm going in alphabetical, alphabetical order. So our first one is Dr. April Harris Akinloye, and she is a GSEP alum, but not just a GSEP alum, she is a double alum for Pepperdine. So welcome, Dr. Akinloye. Thank you so much. I believe you would like a brief introduction at this time. Yes, I would. Uh, just. Give us a little bit about your background and tell us what you're doing right now. Sure. So I attended here, graduated from Seaver. I became a first grade teacher, quickly learned that was not the will of God for my life. And I then became an assistant director of admissions here at Seaver. Um, had an amazing time, um, my favorite job of all, but it also allowed me to see all of the entities that are related to the success of students throughout the university. Um, I then went back to get my PhD. And from there, I worked at LMU, UCLA. Um, I then went to Vanguard University, um, did Title IX, uh, career services a little bit, um, a lot with EEO as well as international students. I wanted to make sure I worked in every capacity of the university because yes. I thought I wanted to be a university chancellor. That is no longer my goal. Um, but here I am now as the assistant vice president for community belonging. Um, this 
this office launched about a year and a half ago. And my responsibilities now are to make sure that each and every person who is affiliated with Pepperdine knows that this is where you belong. And we are here to service you and making sure you have an amazing experience while you're here. Well, that is a huge accomplishment that you have uh, just presented to us. So I can't wait to hear more. So thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And our next speaker, um, panelist, is an author. And we are proud to have uh, Mark Brenner. He is here with us today. Welcome, Mark. I think you're on mute. Oh, there you go. Okay. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate uh, being part of the group. Um, just a little bit about my background. Uh, I spent um, a little over 40 years in staffing and human resources. Um, and the last few years, last 15 years in the business, I had my own company and I sold that in 2013. Um, I then decided that since I couldn't play golf seven days a week, uh, I just, um, I, I wanted to do something and coaching was what I started doing. And uh, initially I uh, put together a 501c3 corporation and was coaching veterans as they transitioned from the military uh, into a civilian career. And then segued that into coaching into the private sector where I do career coaching um, I do some executive coaching and business coaching. Uh, I'm also an adjunct professor at Cal State Northridge uh, in human resource management. And um, I have just as uh, I've just written a book uh, called It's Your Career, It's Your Choice, which is a guide of finding the right job uh, with the right company. And the theme behind the book is basically uh, don't let your career choose you, choose the career that you would like. Oh, that's going to be interesting. I can't wait to hear more about that as we go through this discussion. So thank you so much, Mark, for being here with us today. Uh, I, thank you. Thank you. Uh, our next panelist is another person who has a, a history of connection with Pepperdine. And uh, she is our vice president for community belonging. And that is Dr. Jay Gooseby Smith. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, we can. Great. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Jay Gooseby Smith. And um, I have a similarity with both um, Dr. April Harrisock and Loyer and um, our last panelist. Um, I started off my career as a computer scientist. And so I have a bachelor's of science in computer science from Spelman College. And um, later on, I went into organizational behavior. So I have a master's of business administration and PhD in organizational behavior. And what that enabled me to do was to transition into helping organizations to be more effective with respect to the diversity of their human resources and help them to adjust their climates and practices and policies in order to um, help really harness the benefit of that diversity because without an inclusive culture and fair processes, you really don't reap any benefit from the diversity that you work so hard to hire. And um, along with that, um, I share with um, Mr. Brenner, Dr. Brenner, um, the aspect that I also work with uh, military. In fact, I'm leaving in a few weeks to go train Navy um, ROTC commanders who are transitioning into academe from the military. And so looking at those different cultures. Finally, I also hold a Master of Divinity from the International Interdenominational Theological Center. And that really serves me well here at Pepperdine, which is a faith-based organization. So my research, my publications, my books sit at the intersection of faith, um, diversity, and inclusion. And I do serve as VP Community Belonging and Chief Diversity Officer here at Pepperdine. I work with Dr. April Harrisock and Loye to connect, support, and equip all Pepperdine stakeholders to make this campus even more inclusive than it is. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us today. And we'll hear more from Dr. Gooseby Smith as we continue with the discussion. Um, and our final panelist uh, will, will be Ashley Grundy. And Ashley is a current GSEP student. So welcome, Ashley, to this uh, panel discussion. 
Excellent. Thank you so much. It's great to be here today sharing space with each of you. Um, I actually recently relocated um, from Oregon to California. So just a little bit about me. Um, in that space in Oregon, I worked um, in higher ed, uh, public sector and consulting spaces um, within people, culture, human resources, and DEIB. And I'm currently, in addition to, as mentioned, being a student here in GSEP, I'm also a talent management and DIB strategist for the Southern California Association of Governments, which is the nation's largest metropolitan planning organization. And part of my role is overseeing um, talent and culture, which is inclusive of um, our recruitment processes, uh, DEIB integration, as well as employee engagement overall. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be here and looking forward to the, the dialogue. Thank you so much. So let's get started. So this first question is going to be for Mark and Ashley. Um, we're talking about how the pandemic has impacted organizations. So with both of your backgrounds, could you please talk a little bit about how the pandemic did impact organizations' approach to work and could you tell us a little bit about how it impacted the employer perspective as well as the employee perspective? Okay. Um, I guess to Mark, yeah, I'll start with you. Okay, uh, I, I think the biggest um, change that I've seen um, that that took place during the pandemic and now post pandemic is that the uh, prior to the pandemic, the remote workforce was probably around 25%. Uh, and it has substantially increased um, with the onset of the pandemic. Uh, and um, there now is, um, it, you know, most of there's most companies are really looking now at more of a hybrid workforce than they are as an on site workforce. Um, I know there are some companies that are saying, okay, now the pandemic's over, let's go back to work and everybody come in the office. Right. I, I think that employers have realized for the first time that uh, there is as much productivity from a remote workforce as there is from an on-site workforce, and in some cases, even more. Now, Ashley, what are you seeing? You're in talent management, so what what are you hearing or what are you seeing post pandemic? Certainly, I, I certainly agree with Mark. Uh, flexibility is definitely the word of the day as it pertains to the hybrid and remote models, and also equipping leaders and members of the workforce to understand what it means to be a part of a hybrid or fragmented workplace um, rather than being in one space together, um, and redefining what collaboration means. Um, so there's a greater drive around professional development that is employer provided to give the managers and supervisors, leaders, the tools to effectively engage their teams, as well as for staff to do the same. Um, and in addition to that, there's a, a greater demand more broadly around um, training in order to really identify how to be agile based upon you know, the, the significant shift and change that we saw through the pandemic. And a lot of organizations just weren't prepared for it. Um, so thinking longer term around what are the skills that are necessary and equipping um, not only leaders, but also staff at all levels and all functions with the ability um, to uh, be agile and nimble depending upon uh, changing market conditions. Thank you. So let me just follow up with that. You had mentioned what are the skills that are necessary uh, post pandemic, what are you seeing are the skills that most employers are looking for? I'll, I'll start with you, Ashley, and then I'll, I'll go back to Mark. Yeah, I think it, it's somewhat dependent upon the nature of the organization, um, but broadly speaking, from you know, a market perspective, uh, there's a, a greater emphasis on understanding uh, more of those soft skill dynamics that haven't necessarily fully been um, a part of traditional education models where it's been focused more on technical skills versus that human engagement piece that we need now more than ever, especially as we're working through technological platforms. Okay, Mark, what, what would you say some of those and skills are? I would agree wholeheartedly with that because if we go back 10 years, um, I think you would find that um, 
the technical skills were probably 80% of the hiring decision. Um, in today's uh, employment world, um, the soft skills, the behavioral skills uh, have, have exceeded 50% of the decision-making process. Uh, companies are more interested in whether you're a cultural fit now uh, versus a technical fit. If you have most of the technical skills and all the behavioral skills, uh, the hiring the hiring decision is made easy. Uh, so I, I, I think that you know I'm, I'm in complete agreement that the the soft skills, the behavioral skills, are now probably more important or as important as the technical skills. Okay, that's that's good to know. So if we're looking uh, as an employer, if we're looking for employees, say those who are uh, Gen X, millennials, Gen Z, Gen Z seems to be more technical. They don't seem to have maybe as much as the soft skills that uh, employers are possibly looking for right now. So what would you suggest that they do in order to gain those skills? From you know my standpoint, and I, I think I went into this in, in, in my book, is the fact that uh, is, is understanding what the company is about and what their culture is like uh, and whether you are a cultural fit for that company. Um, as much as a company may have, an, you know, when they have a particular job opening, it is incumbent upon the, uh, the job seeker, if you will, uh, to really get an understanding of what the culture of the company is and if they're actually a fit so they can make that right decision in moving forward with that company. Okay, so that, that gives a good segue um, for me to ask um, April and Jay, uh, as someone who may be looking for a position in different companies, what should we be looking for in a company to find whether we would be a good fit um, for any kind of company that we're going into as an employee, I mean, as a possible employee. You wanna tag team it? I'll start off first. Um, <laughs> one of the things I'll say is that it's extremely important for you to understand the mission of that organization and understand what it exists in order to do. Uh, because that is something that it's going to require you to understand because you'll need to see how what you're doing actually helps to fulfill that mission. So that's uh, one of the first things I'd say. Okay. So understanding the mission. Uh, what else would someone need to do in order to prepare, I guess, um, to maybe go into an interview for one of these organizations that they may have applied for? especially looking at maybe the culture of that organization. You wanna take that one, Dr. A, and yeah, I'll, I'll pick it I think it's always important to do your research. And right now that goes with a lot of Googling and making connections with whomever may be affiliated with that company. It's all about who you know, right? We hear that all the time. Right. So who do you know that knows someone who may have worked there before? Get in contact with them. In doing your research, look at, yes, we want to know the mission, the vision, but what do they contribute their time and their resources to? See if you can find images of how do they do company gatherings? Um, how do they celebrate? Who are they making donations to? That's gonna give you some insight on whether or not this is a place where I can be in alignment with, or I feel like I could be a cultural fit. Anytime I hear of any of my students looking at opportunities for employment, I say, do your research, do your homework. The person that you think you might report to, the person that you want to report to, who are they? Who are they connected with? What do they do? I'll stop there. I could go on. <laughs> <laughs> I'd also add, uh, when I'm looking at civilian uh, workplaces, whether they're corporations or whether they're higher ed or not, one of the things I usually do is a creep up. 
And so um, if it's possible, I'll go to the parking lot and I'll kind of look at how the people, uh, what's their attire? Um, what does it look like that they're doing? I'll also search through news stories and I'll try to find any gossip or scandals from the company. I look at the different uh, salary reports to see how they report salary and what people say about the organization. But any organization is really going to be focused on, um, if it's doing at least a triple bottom line, it'll be focused on people and it'll okay. be focused on profits and it'll be focused on the planet. So you can also pull, if it's publicly traded, you can pull the annual reports of that company because the annual report will really tell you um, both in pictures and in words and in data, what that company really thinks is important. For example, organizations may talk about inclusion being important, but if they don't mention that at all in their annual reports, um, then that is a little bit of a, a disconnect there. I'd also look at what stories are available about the organization. And if, as Dr. A said, if you know people who have worked for that organization, mm -hmm. tap into them and call them. And I've actually had people to look me up and call me before they start interviewing with the company. So sometimes you can look on LinkedIn, see okay. who um, is a part of that organization and reach out to some of those people. So those are some of the pieces of advice that I would say, but the culture of the organization, you really won't know that until you're in the organization or unless right. you talk with somebody who's in it. That's, that's very good information. That's good to know. I'm taking notes myself. So when you see me looking down, I'm also taking notes. <laughs> if, if, I, if I could make a quick comment. Yes. Uh, uh, as far as the interview is concerned, I agree with everything that every, everything that, that has been said. But the one theme about the interview uh, that we have to consider is when, an, when an, a potential employee is interviewing, they have to understand that it is also their interview too. They're interviewing the company as much as the company's interviewing them. They can make a decision, and I, you know, I've had this happen before and I've had it happen to me, where I've made a decision halfway through an interview that I don't want to work for this company. And, okay. you, know, you know, you kindly end the interview, but uh, uh, never, nevertheless, I think that having that theme that the interview is your interview uh, is, is really important and getting an understanding and asking the questions that you need to know about the job and the work culture and the workplace uh, are extremely important. Ashley, I'm gonna bring you in and ask about this same thing. Um, everything that everyone has said has been so important. What else can you add to that for a candidate who is looking for a position and what, what they should look for as they're looking for a job? Sure, absolutely. I noted, um, Yas mentioned in the chat, kind of this the dynamic between culture fit versus culture add. Um, and that's such an important assessment to understand what mindset or framework an organization is working from as they are making a hire and, and how they're defining fit, what it's based upon from a behavioral and competency perspective and how they came to that determination. Um, and if the, the variables that they're assessing are truly aligned with the work itself versus some arbitrary factors um, to assess candidacy. Um, and this culture ad dynamic is something that is, is becoming more popular and really looking at how a person can come in and contribute to diversity of thought. And that's important from driving the innovation. And it's also important to recognize that the expectation is for the person to come into the organization and be the sole change maker. Mm -hmm. um, if there's a weight of, of change being placed on one person somewhat from a savioristic standpoint, um, or if there's... Um, a wraparound support in order to drive meaningful, sustainable add to the culture uh, within the organization versus, again, it being on one person to do so. So really asking those questions around what is the support, who would I be working with inside and outside of the direct team? Okay, that's good to know. Culture add as opposed to culture fit. Okay, so as someone who may be hired already, for a specific position and they're coming in, how do they portray their authentic self in the organization? A lot of times when we first step into a role, we, we wanna be very professional, 
Um, and we want to try and fit into what's going on, but that may or may not be how we truly feel or how we truly are. So how do we present ourselves, present our authentic selves within an organization that we first step into without seeming fake, I guess you could say. So I'll, I'll take comment from, from any of the panelists on that. I'm going to be the 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 the, the contra argument here, um, okay. and then we just go back and forth from there. Um, an organization exists to fulfill its goals. An organization um, in the United States in a capitalistic economy is exists to create a profit. Mm -hmm. It exists in order to um, require human and other resources to achieve that profit. And hopefully the other part of that triple bottom line, which is planet or ecology to do as little damage and hopefully maybe to help the planet. And so when it comes to being your authentic self, I think that we as human beings are contextual people. You're not the same way in talking with your mother right. as you are in speaking with your pastor as you are in talking with your friends and walking down the street. And so I think that there is a balance to be reached of being one's authentic self and bringing one's full self to work in terms of fulfilling the organization's goals. That's why I mentioned mission first, because I am not the same with my children as I am, you know, we're different contextual people. So I right. do not think, um, and this is coming from an MBA and a PhD in management. So I'm coming from a business discipline. I do not think it is the role of the business, the whole mission to seek the 100% authentic expression of every single person in that organization. I don't think that's possible. Mm -hmm. But what I do think is when you come into an organization, you need to look at what your deepest values are what that organization's values are and find points where you can genuinely and authentic support, authentically support those. Now we all know that when we look at, um, when we look at professionalism, that a lot of times that's a very culturally loaded term. Mm -hmm. And so I think that some of those things have to be. So for example, there was a hair law that was passed in California that you yes. could not discriminate against people based upon hair. I have braids at the present moment. Um, there was a woman who was working at the front desk of a Marriott in Washington, D.C. several years ago who lost her job and won a lawsuit. So if being able to uh, present my hair in a way that's healthy for it is part of being authentic, then yes. I have literally every job interview I've gone on, I've either worn my hair naturally or I've worn it in braids because as um, Mark said, it's not just their interview, it's your interview as well. And if that one factor is something that's gonna make an organization weed me out, then let's let's have the divorce before the marriage and just do it early. So that's my perspective. So I do think that we should be able to be ourselves and yes. be at our best, but I do not feel the organization um, is beholden and purposed and missioned to have that as its, as its mission. So I think it's a give and a take and it's a flexibility. Okay, and just to let everyone know, um, the act that uh, Jay was referring to is the Crown Act regarding um, hair and not being discriminated against because of your hair. Um, did anyone else have a <laughs> Yes, Mark, yes. <laughs> Uh-oh, Mark, you're, um, we can't hear you. I was going to say, I don't have to worry about the hair issue. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. Did, did anyone else have a comment about that, about being your authentic self within the workplace? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I, I very much appreciate um, the, the sentiment that you shared, Dr. Gisby Smith. I, I think it's a, it's a very important perspective to share because there's there's somewhat of a disservice placed um, for job seekers kind of having this expectation um, to be able to be their full selves without that context of the environment that they're in. And I think really the bottom line is whether or not there's psychological safety to be able to contribute to the workforce in the way that a person has a desire to do as they are considering how to align with the mission 
vision and values of the organization. And if that alignment is there, is the safety there to do the work in an innovative way? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. You know, at this time, uh, we are opening everything up for questions. And it looks like we do have a question from Melissa. Yes, hi, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for uh, this. Thank you for all of this. Uh, really good information so far. Um, Dr. Dr. Gooseby Smith, I'm just, and I, I want to phrase this question in 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 a way that um, that is respectful because I, I definitely don't question whether or not it happened. But how do you know when you were being like? I mean, did somebody say something to you about your your hair, or was there like behavior or something that that indicated that 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 you were that they discriminated? discriminated against you here just for my personal knowledge I mean I would be interested just as a fellow employee if somebody were being discriminated against I would want to be conscientious of that and you know be mindful of that so that I don't know I mean so that I could be supportive to that person and you know validate their experience Oh, so um, what I was saying was that many times in organizations, because we're in a society that has particular standards of beauty, if you look at who the, the supermodels are, who the, look at the Fortune um, 500 and look at all of the CEOs, one mm -hmm. appearance type of bias that you will notice is that almost all of the men are clean shaven. And so mm -hmm. being clean shaven is a norm in mm -hmm. um, the US, however, if you look in some organizations, um, there's a condition called pseudofolliculitis, which is basically razor bumps that will impact men who have a different hair texture. And so, mm -hmm. um, some of the sometimes those men will be told that they're not being professional because the notion of professionality has to do with a clean shaven face. Similarly, for women, uh -huh. oftentimes when you look at the standards of professionalism in the United States, it has to do with straight hair. So you have people straightening their hair chemically and mechanically. And then when someone's hair does not comport to that straightened hair aesthetic, then they will often say that that person is not being professional. And so one of the ways you can know if some of these things are going on in an organization um, is that you can hear people in mentoring conversations, you can listen to what advice people are giving up and coming people, and you can look at the variety of aesthetics that the leaders in that organization have. I was not discussing a particular um, incident of being discriminated against. What I was saying was that I proactively head off the capacity for that discrimination in any interviews that I do, and I deliberately have my hair in a hairstyle that, that does not comport to the straightened norm so that I can tell if that's going to be any type of distracting factor during the interview or anything of that nature, then I want to know that at that point. And a person does not have to say anything to let you know that they don't approve of how you may choose to wear your hair. They may stare at you. They may ask questions. They may, if that becomes the fixation of the topic in the interview, that's mm -hmm. one way that it lets me know. But I was not speaking of a particular um, discriminatory incident. Okay. I, okay. Thank you for the clarification. And thank you for answering my question. Thank you for your question. Does anyone else have a question for our panelists? I do have a, a question. It looks like um, that was in the comments. Uh, when you are preparing for your interview, when you're getting ready to go on a job interview, um, Mark, you had mentioned that not only is the company interviewing you, you're interviewing the company. So what questions should the candidate have for the company um, in order to prepare for their interview of the company? I, well, I, I usually ask uh, or suggest to my, my coaching clients that they prepare 10 questions that they want to ask the company um, during the course of the interview. And, you know, I always say, you're not, don't talk about salary, don't talk about benefits, but you're going to ask questions about the company culture, about the department uh, that you'd be working in. 
um, uh, you know, how, what kind of, in, if you're comfortable, you know, the more comfortable you are in the interview process, the more questions you can ask, like, uh, you know, uh, what's the, what, what's the turnover rate in the department? Okay. Uh, and you can ask questions like, is this particular position a new position or a replacement position? And if it's a replacement position and you're comfortable, you can ask, why did the last person leave? And this okay. will give you, this will give you an idea and a feeling of, of, of comfort uh, during the interview process. Uh, you know, again, it's just you're interviewing them too. You're you're trying to make sure that this is a right fit for you. Um, I've developed a, um, uh, a circle, what I call a circle of acceptance, and I ask my my clients to put down what is acceptable to them within the circle and what is not acceptable to them. And as they move towards the circumference of the circle outside the middle. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. And then once it gets outside the circle, it's not okay. And then you can make your decision from there. Mark, give us the name of your book again. It's called, It's Your Career, It's Your Choice. It's Your Career, It's Your Choice. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so yeah, much. There's a, also, there's a special section in there for veterans who are transitioning. Oh, yes. Oh, that's good to know. Thank you. And Dr. Smith, Gooseby Smith, you said you also had some publications. Could you also mention your publication? Uh, my publications are in the scholarly um, realm. One book is called Beyond Inclusion, which looks at um, a research summary of eight dimensions of what makes people feel included at work based upon talking with roughly 7,000 people. And another one, it's called uh, Blessed Are Those Who Ask the Questions. It's about uh, what questions we should be asking about management, spirituality, and religion. But can I add two things to the yes. interview list? Yes. Um, one of the things that is so powerful are stories. You know, we remember stories. And so, and also when you ask people about to, to share a story, they oftentimes aren't as censored. And so I will ask the person I'm interviewing with, tell me about a person who was just a rock star in this organization. Tell me what made that person so excellent. And that's my way of kind of getting at what really matters in that organization. And then I'll also ask that person that I'm interviewing with, what's their favorite thing about working in that organization, what they love the most? Because what I'm basically doing, and I didn't know it was a value circle, but it really is basically what Mark is saying. I'm, when I ask them what they love my, most about the organization, I'm trying to see how my values align with their values and preferences so I can see how to gauge what they say. So for example, I was interviewing one place and they said, oh, this person um, was just such a rock star in the organization. They used to have a sleeping bag under their desk and they were just so dedicated to clients and to students. It was in a university that sometimes they'd spend the night in their office and they were just so dedicated. And I was like, oh, I need to tap out of this one because this is gonna be a good culture for me. I was a single parent, widowed, caretaking and elder with dementia. And so I knew that type of work ethic and operational tempo wasn't gonna work. Yes, oh my goodness, yes. Thank you for that, for those, um particular questions to ask. Uh, April, you have your hand raised. I was just gonna comment on, again, the questions to ask. I think it's important that you ask who you might have to collaborate with most in the position that you're seeking. Maybe it's not an individual, but what other department you'll be working with. Um, just so you then hopefully you're going to advance to the next round, but in that in between time, you can go research what is that other department and who is in that other department to prepare you for, oh, let's see what they're about and how things work. I think another, and this goes in, a, in alignment with what Jay was saying about the storytelling, ask them to tell you a story about a time the team was stressed or had to meet a deadline. What's that process of who do they talk to and how do they work out the kinks? Because then you can find out where do you fit in and helping that process and how and how they advance in working out whatever issues might come up. So just a little tidbit. Oh, that's good to know. That's good to know. Uh, let me see, I have one more question. Um, 
can the panel give advice on how to approach the job search or interviews when transitioning industries? Oh, yes, Jay. Go ahead, Ashley. I'll add real quickly um, that kind of ties into this conversation around uh, questions for panels as well. Uh, one could be around what is the onboarding process so you can understand how you're going to be set up for success as you enter the organization, especially if you're transitioning um, into a new field. Um, and as it pertains to really marketing yourself um, as you are transitioning, really highlighting transferable skills that you have picked up and mastered through your previous career that you could easily translate into a new experience. Okay. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'd, I'd 100% um, agree with that because that's one of the things that I have found so fun um, being the daughter and widow and significant other of veterans is when they're coming from the military into the civilian workplace or coming into academe, a lot of times they're looking literally at the job description and they don't think that they've done those things. But when you really delve down to what you're doing, look beyond the title of it and look down to what are the skills that you are using and then start to talk with people in that new industry or people who understand your industry and the new one to help you translate your resume into those different terms. So like I said, I came from software engineering into diversity and inclusion, and those are very different things, but both of them involve some skills that are very transferable, like being able to analyze situations, being able to um, come up with and understand systemic relationships between different parts. So I would say to translate your skills, talk with somebody who knows what you're doing and someone who's in the new skill. And basically you're gonna to have to rewrite your resume. And sometimes you just have not done a thing, but then you can point to what is evidence that you're capable of learning it and that you have the building blocks to do it. Yes, Mark. Uh, I, would, I have a whole section in my book on transitioning careers. And um, a lot of the clients that I work with are mid to late career folks that want to make a, a complete transition. And I think it's important that um, the most important thing about transitioning a career is to find where your passions are, to find what you actually want to do. And the, the way to get to that point is to start networking, uh, is to network into companies where you might want to work and start talking to people. And I have, I've had dozens of occasions where I've had folks network into companies, I'll let them know what they wanna do. And the job was either created for them or there was a job for them. So I think that the, the transitioning, the person who's transitioning careers needs to understand that they need to network into the company that they're looking to work for. Hey Mark, can I can I ask a qu quick question of Mark? How would you advise undergrad students to sort of do some of that networking to look into different companies? Uh, I, I would I would well I would use I, I use uh, and and kind of promote LinkedIn. I think that's probably the best uh, the best site to use to really seek out the person that you want to talk to um, and. Uh, especially finding that career choice that you want to make. I mean, one, one of the things that uh, I try to Im impress upon people is, again, don't let the career choose you. Don't, don't get a job offer and think it's good because you may end up spending 40 years in that, in that position and look back and say, what did I do? Um, and I, you know, I, I can say that to you from personal experience. Uh, because that actually happened to me. And that was one of the reasons for um, the, you know, to, for wanting to write the book so that it doesn't happen to other people. So it's just basically networking into companies, finding out if that company is right for you, and finding out the kind of position that you might want to do uh, and what might want to work in. Uh, you might be very surprised to find that what your goal may have been will change because you now have an interest in something else. Yes, thank you. I must say thank you to all the panelists. Um, 
I'm going to have to transition because this conversation could keep going on. And there are some questions in the chat. So if there are, if you're able to answer some of the questions, that would be great. So at this time, we were talking about transitioning. I'm going to transition to Yaz so that she can introduce our next speaker. So thank you so much to all of the panelists and for all of your advice to everyone who has joined us today. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Dorn, and thank you to each of our panelists. Again, just the fact that you volunteered your time to be here today to share your wisdom and experience really speaks to who you are as people and um, your willingness to support our, our Pepperdine community. Um, without further ado, I'd like to transition to Nick Ebling with JobScan. So um, one of the learning outcomes for today is to really help you develop or connect to tools that can get you the interview in today's job search market. And so Nick is going to talk today about our partnership with JobScan and do a, a brief demonstration about how you can maximize this platform. Yeah, thank you, Yes. Um, so hey, everybody, I'm Nick. Uh, I'm the senior account manager with JobScan. Um, I oversee partnerships for universities, nonprofits, and outplacements. And I do just want to say, I want to thank all the panelists as well. Um, I thought that conversation was really insightful. So thank you very much for letting me join and listen in. Um, all right, so with JobScan, um, essentially JobScan is, I think I could probably ramble on here for about 30 minutes about the value behind JobScan. But I think the best way to describe it is it's a tool to help you get more interviews. Um, you know, we're going to, I'm going to do a little bit of a demonstration here about applicant tracking systems. Um, unfortunately, I don't think I'll have the time to get through everything that we can offer with JobScan, but I can give you a quick overview um, in terms of like, we offer, you know, resume building, resume scanning, cover letter scanning, LinkedIn optimization, and then what we call job tracker, which is our way of kind of organizing where we are in the job search process. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen here, and I'm going to talk a little bit about applicant tracking systems. So yeah, as y'all said, or um, as y'all said, we uh, we want to utilize automation to kind of get the leg up on the competition here. And I think um, this segue into like applicant tracking systems is perfect because you know applicant tracking systems are being utilized by companies to let me jump slides here. To kind of help scale the job of Nick, I'm sorry to oh. interrupt. It's showing your email instead of the slides. I it just wanted okay. to let you know. Thank you for that. Ah, yeah, you're right. Chose the wrong screen. All right, we good now. Yeah, we're good now. Okay. Um so applicant tracking systems have been put in place to kind of help scale the job of a of a recruiter. You know, if um if Amazon yields upwards of like 2000 applicants a day, as a recruiter, I'm not gonna go through all 2000 resumes. Instead, I'm gonna put it into a form of automation that's gonna pull out key terminology and likely send me like the best 30 resumes from those applicants. From there, I'll actually go through them and decide who I might interview. Um, I think as y'all said, you know, we're, we wanna utilize automation because if these companies are utilizing automation to get kind of a leg up on their applicant pool, then we should do the same. So that's where JobScan can come into play. Um, ATSs are utilized by 99% of Fortune 500 companies. Now, that being said, you know, companies big and small are utilizing ATSs. Here at JobScan, we conduct market research on roughly like, I think it's like 70 ATSs that are out on the market. Um, and they're utilized by companies that are big and small. Even here at JobScan, we have 40 employees and we utilize one of the more popular ones, which is Workday. Um, I've got a quick list here on the applicant tracking systems, but again, we don't have a ton of time left. So I'm actually just going to dive into a resume scan to help us get that leg up on the competition that we're looking for. So if I jump over here, I'm going to be in my job scan user dashboard. So the nice thing about job scan is this is a completely unlimited tool for all the Pepperdine students and Pepperdine alumni that are interested in this. We will put a link in the chat to show you how to sign up. Um, I have the option to build as many resumes, apply to as many jobs as I'd like, and scan as many um, job descriptions as I'd like. So the two major things I'm going to go over today are going to be our resume scanner and then our job tracker. Um, I don't think we'll have enough time to get to LinkedIn, but I do have a quick video that I can put in our chat in case you're interested about the LinkedIn optimization. And whoever's question it was about um, transitioning job industries, LinkedIn is a great tool to utilize for that. Um, so definitely check out that video if you have time. 
so what I have here is what I call a rough draft resume and a job description for a communication director over at Goodwill Industries. I pulled this off um, Google. I do want to let you know that in terms of best practices, there's a few things that I'll point out here. When we're pulling a job description, we do have a um, Google Chrome plugin that can pull directly off of Indeed. But it's important to note that the major things I want to put in this box are going to be the qualifications, the requirements, and the company values. So in other words, I don't want to include things like benefits or like wages or like health insurance or anything like that, because those can differ state to state and they can kind of throw in uh, different hard skills that are not relevant to the position. So I'll go ahead and scan my resume that I've already put in here on a copy and paste function against that job description. All right, so our true bread and butter to, to job scan as a whole is going to be our ATS tracker or our ATS identifier. Um, as you can see here, I've got this all lined up. I've got the correct, uh, this is a scan name that I chose for um, tracking purposes, but I've got my job title in here, the company name. And then if I actually pull a job description off of Google, I'm going to want to, I don't want to utilize that Google URL in here. The ATS that's being utilized is going to pull from the actual URL of the job board. So in other words, if I find this Goodwill job on Google, I want to go to Goodwill Industries, look at their career page and pull their um that URL doesn't even need to be the same job, but pull that URL and put it into this box. So as we can see here, Goodwill is utilizing ISIMS. I'm going to view these ATS facts. So the difference between these ATSs is, is that they can be so incredibly particular. Um, primary differences is going to be like tenses of terminology. So, you know, I could be a shoe in for a position, like I have the education, I know I have the experience to back this position, but if I'm going through an ATS and there's a you know, whatever I'm at right here, 38%, 36% chance that this uh, recruiter is actually going to view my resume, then I know that I can change around the terminology and the structure of those tenses and sentence structure in order to actually have a better chance of passing through. So I know that ISIMS, I believe it says it right here, ISIMS does recognize uh, variations, plurals, and different tenses, i.e. product manager or product management. It'll pick that up. Some of them will not, though. I know that Taleo is a very sensitive system that actually does not identify differences like customer service or customer services. So again, we're going to want to match. I think best practice is just going to be to match whatever uh, the job description actually writes. Um, best practices here, again, we got contact information, um, education match. It requires a bachelor's degree. I have one. Um, section headings and date formattings are also going to be really important depending on the ATS we're going against. So Having section headings in here that state, I believe that for ISIMS, it's education and experience. If I had like the word work in there, I would get a red X here indicating that I have the wrong terminology. And it's really important here in case this information is actually uh, parsed and not, you know, the recruiter is not going to see the entire resume. Instead, they might just get like a quick blurb of my most recent education or my most recent experience. Um, following into that is going to be date formatting as well. Ensuring that I have the correct date formatting in there, which I believe our standard now is going to be abbreviated month or spelled out month and year. Um, if I have them numerically and separated by periods and slashes, those can become jumbled in the system. They might get like my internship from high school as opposed to my most recent experience that they're aiming for. So understanding the ATS that we're going against. And then, of course, we have our terminology breakdown with hard and soft skills. As you see here, um, I've got a pretty bad representation. I, I guess, sorry, let me let me restart here by saying I, I came in here with a 36% on my initial scan, my first uh, resume that I went up against this job description with. I'm not aiming for 100% here. My, my overall goal is going to be to better my chances of passing through this ATS. Um, in order to do that, you know, if I can get this 36 up to like a 60%, I've nearly doubled my chances of passing through. I think that's a really important note to kind of keep in mind there because, I mean, truth be told, 100% is extremely difficult to get. Um, you know, I applied with JobScan and uh, I was using JobScan when I did so. I think I applied with the 62%. I got the interview. I got the job. So um, don't be discouraged if you have a lower match rate. Just know that we're going to, you likely have the right terminology in there. It's just not in the correct sentence structure. So hard and soft skill breakdown, um, again, all the terminology that's represented in the job description, where I have it in my resume, if I actually click on this terminology, I can see where it is in the job description and where I have it in my resume. Soft skills, same breakdown, but medium score impact, it's not going to be as impactful when it comes to like an ATS. Hard skills are definitely going to take the cake there. 
Um, other keywords are just very prevalent terminology in there. And then our recruiter tips. So essentially, you know, we know the ATS that we're going against. We know the terminology we're missing, but we want to ensure that the recruiter likes what they see on our resume. So things like word count, you know, measurable results, the numerical findings behind our experiences are so incredibly valuable. And we know that our recruiters absolutely love them. Lastly, I really like this section. It's our words to avoid. It's like cliche terminology or negative terminology. Um, I think the word positive or uh, I'm blanking. Passionate is now on there as like something that our recruiters don't really want to see anymore. Additionally, if I had something in there, like I obliterated the competition in my last role comes off far too aggressive. We'd flag that and say, Hey, change this up. Um, so as I'm working on this, this is my first job. I want to jump over to my power editing tool where I'm going to be able to live edit this resume. So as you can see all the terminology that I'm missing here on the left side, and then my original resume. So I see that I'm missing the term. I don't even know what this is, F-L-S-A. As we can see, we've got a live score increase up 2%. So obviously, I don't want to just throw this in here. Um, we've worked with a lot of students before that have tried to put this terminology into white font and send it in through an ATS. doesn't work like that. So we definitely want to work it into a sentence where it's appropriate um, in order to just gain that best overall percentage as we can. So I know I'm moving a little bit fast. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat and I can definitely get to them um, after this portion. Uh, what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to scan a better resume so we can see just a better overall score. Now, I already created all these resumes, so you'll have to bear with me. Boom. I did an upload function. If you copy and paste, just so you know, formatting won't carry over and we're not able to provide you with any formatting tips. Um, if you actually upload it, then the formatting will carry over and we can provide some of those best practices in formatting. Now, that being said, this system purely bases the grading off of content. So if you have, you know, a template that you're utilizing that doesn't line up with what we consider an ATS friendly template, don't worry, the grading system's purely off of content. But as you can see here, I got a 55% overall. Um, I have a lot better representation of some of those hard skills. I think there's going to be a lot here if I press show more and soft skills as well. Um, if I continue to scroll down, it looks like I still don't have the five measurable results that we request, but it's not going to change my overall score. This is kind of considered formatting because, you know, a lot of students or even just um, people that have been in a, the similar career for quite, a, oh, sorry, quite some time, they might not have five measurable results. That's totally fine. You don't have a red X. We've got like this little traffic cone indicating that if you have it, add it. If not, it's totally fine. Um, so once I'd be finished with actually editing this, we'll just pretend I edited it all the way through and I got to this 55%. I'm going to go ahead and save this, which will save it to my job tracker, our way of helping individuals organize where they are in the job search process. So, you know, I've kind of picked this industry that I'm going for. I'm going to apply to a couple jobs here. As you can see, I've got the jobs that I've just scanned once, jobs that I've applied for, jobs that I actually have scheduled interviews for, and jobs that I've already interviewed for. If we click on one of these, we have a little drag and drop functionality here. So if I do get the call and I have the scheduled interview, I can drag it over, but really like this portion of this. Um, if we jump in here and I actually get an interview, what I wanna do is kind of input when that interview is, um, include information about the interviewee or interviewer, excuse me, maybe their LinkedIn page. I actually set this this morning where um, I've got a representation from, oh, she's a Pepperdine alumni, so am I, my aliases, I should say. Um, that's gonna be my opening conversation. Now, the nice thing about this is actually when I save interview, it sets it to my Google Calendar. So it's gonna go straight to my Gmail for me to add directly in. It's really nice to kind of just, you know, I think previously we got a lot of reports that people were interviewing, or sorry, that they were um, organizing their job search based on like on an Excel file. So really great way to kind of map it all out and where I am. Um, so I know that that was really fast. Um, I do have a bunch of videos in our learning center that I can follow up with for our LinkedIn optimization and our cover letter scanning and our resume builder as well. I just really wanted to kind of show the value and the um, importance of the applicant tracking system identifier and how to kind of combat that when we're in our job search process. So I know that we're at time here. Um, if there's any questions for me, please feel free to throw it in the chat. I'm going to put in a couple videos right now, though, so that you have them. And then I'm going to pass it back to Yas if you want to 
jump in there while I put these in here. Great. Thank you so much, Nick. And I know you have to go through that quickly, but hopefully um, our participants have a glimpse now of what this tool is capable of doing. And um, Nick, I can also add the resources from the chat. I can add them to the drive where students can access those later as well. I, I got a bunch so. of videos walkthroughs, so I will definitely include those. Um, oh, sorry great. for the rush there. Um, appreciate the time to kind of, uh, kind of go over the value though of JobScan. Great, thank you so much. Well, I know that we are at time, so I wanna be mindful of that. Um, and those of you- Excuse me, I, I put a question in the chat. I don't think it got seen. Oh, I'm got sorry. it. Okay. If you want to, oh, it's um, how much does a account with JobScan cost for our GSEP students and alumni? It's free. Okay. JobScan premium is free. Otherwise, yeah. the regular account, you have up to three or five scans. Yeah. If you're not an alumni with Pepperdine, it's five free scans a month. And I think it's like $49.99 a month after that. So definitely utilize the alumni status with um, and student status with Pepperdine. Okay, Nick. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. I realize we're a couple minutes over and um, we just really appreciate everyone for being here. And this closes out our fall 2022 JME career webinar series. So for those of you who are wondering what's ahead in the spring, I just wanted to highlight our lineup. So in February, we will have the Career Connect session called To Doctorate or Not It. So for those of you who are trying to figure out if the doctoral pathway is right for you, this is a great session to attend. In March, we have global applications of your GSEP degree. So for those of you who are interested in what international opportunities are out there where you can utilize your degree, this would be a great session. And then finally in April, for those of you who are wanting to advance towards executive leadership, we have the C-suite pathway for education and psychology. And these are interactive learning sessions. So you'll have an opportunity to get in breakout conversations with our speakers. Um, oops. So we'd love your feedback. We use the feedback to actually help improve our JME career webinar series, as well as to get ideas for future topics. So we will have a, an opportunity for those who um, complete the survey. You'll have an opportunity to, um, to receive an Amazon gift card. We'll do a, an opportunity drawing to be able to receive that. And then finally, speaking of networking, please utilize GSEP's networking opportunities too, that by following different thought leaders, alumni, other students, faculty and staff on LinkedIn, through Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, you have an opportunity to really form these relationships with the, the Pepperdine community and with others who are pursuing the type of work that you might be interested in doing. So we encourage you to um, connect via social media. Thank you again. Hope to see all of you in spring. Have a wonderful holiday for those of you who are celebrating next week, and um, we'll see you again soon. Thanks so much.